Hey guys, welcome back. Today, you guys have asked for it. You wanted an introduction type series dealing with isopods. You, didn't, you want to still see all that action, that cool isopod action, but you guys, guys wanted to know the absolute basics. So today, we're going to tackle dealing with substrates. So let's get to it. Now we gotta bear in mind, isopods are an animal that is found out in nature and it's found generally on the forest floor, in caves and so forth. And they're a decomposer. They're detrivores. They help break down products to make it even to a smaller, more finite area for the th smaller microfauna that it'll take care of and then it recycles back to life. So when we're making up a substrate for maintaining isopods in a sterilite or rubber-made type of bin sort of thing, We've got to be conscious that we're going to have all the components that are required for a nice mix for them, but also for to, to support life. Now what I do is, my components are derived slightly different than would be what would be say the standard and often used in vivariums or planting and so forth in different types of environments or isopods, people use what's known as ABG mix and that's from the Atlantic Atlanta Botanical Garden and it's a mix that is comprised of a bit of charcoal, Generally, it's comprised of uh, tree fern, two, two parts tree fern, and it's also using orchid bark, and it uses peat moss. Now, that mix will work as well for isopods, but there are some components and things that you have to consider and some things that you may have to alter depending on the species that you're going to be keeping. Now, all mixes that I use, I start out with the base. Now, digress for a second, get back to my last point. When I talk about the reason that you're going to have to change it is there's no matter what I'm going to tell you today will always work for every isopod. We have isopods like a lot of your Kubara species that inhabit limestone caves. They're going to need a small, a much higher alkaline or higher hardness level or pH level within their substrate mix than say some of the species that inhabit say a forest floor with lots of decomposing plant matter. But if we use a nice general basic mix, we can alter that chemistry of that substrate depending on what we need. So I like using a good product like sea soil. Any of the components that use things such as worm casting, sea soil uses has all those different types of minerals and stuff that are harvested from the bottom of the sea. Any of the ones that use good component would be things like bat guano. Any of these natural, organic, no fertilizers added, no unnatural products added, a good quality, that's a good base for me to start. Now, it's too heavy on its own, so we want to add components to it. Now, a lot of people use peat moss. Peat moss is a great, great product. It's, it's somewhat sustainable, so it's readily available. It's harvested from peat bogs. The only problem with peat is it is extremely, extremely acid in regards to its pH level. So it will, unless you're going to strongly buffer it to maybe neutralize it a little bit, uh, I think that that's a product that I prefer to steer away. With my schedule where I'm traveling and I'm constantly on the go and, and having to monitor that at alkalinity level within the pH or the substrate, I think is doing too much challenging. So I personally do not use peat moss. Another product that people use is core, and core is coconut fiber. Now you can get coconut fiber in the powdered form, and it is sold in horticultural stores all over the world. Uh, and it, they often sell, this one's called Beet Peat. And basically you would have to take this product, and I'm not kidding, this piece here, you'd have to put this in about a five gallon, no, sorry, about a garbage can size. A five gallon pail is what they generally use for those ones that are about the size of an individual brick that you can buy at horticultural stores, garden centers, and pet stores. Uh, uh, but this one here is probably gonna take the equivalent of a, either a big Rubbermaid tub, and it's gonna fill it, or a garbage can, and you're gonna add water to it, and then this thing's gonna expand greatly its size. So it says, yeah, it gives you up to three cubic feet of product. Now, the only other thing that you're definitely gonna to wanna to consider using this is it comes, in, it comes in this real fine granulated form, which is similar to the peat moss. This one does not have that, uh, it's a bit more neutral in its pH. It also does come in a milled form, which is uh, called chunk, coconut chunks. And it is even coarser than some of the pieces that you find the stuff here. And that is an excellent long lasting component in your substrate mixes. And I do have that as well and I do use it. I only had six tubs available so I had to use the components that I would generally use. 
So the only thing that you have to consider when you're using products made out of core or coconut fiber is the fact that they are often, depending on where they're sourced, is they are often very, very high in salts. So I use a TDS meter and I actually, when I go and make this batch and I put this in the garbage can or the big Rubbermaid and I add all that water, I will actually go and test that water for total dissolved solids afterwards and see what the salt levels are. Because if it's really, really high in salts, you're gonna wanna leach it really, really well. And what that means is you're gonna wanna strain that product out of that water and then refill it with water again and slowly remove all those soluble salts and minerals out of it. And then that product is safe to use. This is probably more so important if you were using it in say a vivarium where you may have something like an amphibian or something like a newt or a salamander or a frog. Then that, 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 that all those dissolved minerals can potentially become problematic and cause some harm. But for most purposes, this is a standard go-to product that a lot of people use. What we will be using for the bulk of our mix, we've got our base and then these are the added components we're going to add to it. Now, to, one other factor, a thing that I, and I just don't have it here, is orchid bark. A lot of people like using orchid bark, and it is an excellent, excellent additive. I just didn't happen. I can use this product or orchid bark simultaneously, and neither I'd have one advantage over another. Other than this one here will probably last a little bit longer. This is cypress mulch, uh, 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 whereas uh, orchid bark is usually made out of fir trees. So cypress mulch is a wet wood, meaning it'll probably hold up a lot longer. When I was breeding certain types of snakes that were very, very wet, I used this as the substrate in their cages and it basically got to the point that I would only have to spot clean and then maybe only clean their cage out once every six months or so. So I absolutely love using things like cypress mulch. So we've got our good quality soil. We've got some cypress mulch. This would be like the, the, the broken down bark type product. This will provide a lot of air spaces within that mix. So there's two factors right away. The other big component is adding horticultural charcoal. And let's take a quick peek at how I made this charcoal. For charcoal for my substrates, I instead of buying the pre-made, you know, the, the broken down all ready to go, I can make it myself far cheaper. I buy a good quality, you'll notice here it says 100% natural lump hardwood charcoal. Hardwood's important and the fact that it's lump and there's absolutely nothing added to it. So basically what you're gonna have is you're gonna have something that's gonna look like this, but using one of these, I'm using it happened to be in the bucket of the tractor, but uh, I wanted something hard and I could just, this literally took like two minutes of smashing it down. And this stuff is all the perfect grade size for what we're gonna need it for, for our parting mix additive. Now this charcoal here, as you saw, I milled it right down to the point that it's, it's a lot more usable. Charcoal acts as a very, very good quality sweetener to the mix. It absorbs impurities and things out of the mix. It keeps the mix healthier longer. So good quality charcoal goes a long way. Now the other two factors that are very, very critical is mosses. Mosses provide moisture beds, and they also provide lots of natural nutrition. So the standard go-to that most people use is the long-fibered New Zealand sphagnum moss, which is this type of product here. It comes from other sources as well, and uh, depending on the quality, it's depending on how fibrous and how big it actually is. But the other thing that I like using, and I use it a lot, is these natural forest mosses. I, you just can't get enough of these products. The animals actually break them down, but this little unit itself, once saturated water, becomes a nice moisture bed for the animals underneath. It provides lots of shelter and it provides nutrition for a lot of your different species like your armadillidiums, which are primary herbivores. So a lot of different types of mosses like that. Other products you can use, this is one of the ones that's available on the market by a product by a company called Hagen, and it is another expandable product of green sheet moss. So this is gonna expand about three times and give you a lot of product. And it'll kind of in between these two products here. Now a big factor that a lot of people use in that ABG mix was the tree fern that I mentioned. The only problem with tree fern is tree fern is not readily available, especially in Canada. It is a CITES protected plant. So harvesting it and any parts thereof is very, very challenging to get within our country. It requires a lot of paperwork. And with a lot of paperwork, that also includes a lot of higher price than it may very well need to be. But it is a product that generally comes from New Zealand or Australia. So not readily, readily available here, at least in Canada. And it is an extremely excellent quality product, but it performs the same benefit as does this. It provides aeration and long lasting durability within the substrate. Now, the, the most important one at the end is definitely, in my opinion, is this product here. This is not a product you can buy at a store. Here's an absolute ultimate score. Look at all this rotting wood. This is absolutely perfect stuff 
for isopods. But reality is this is probably the biggest and most important component that I use in my isopod substrates and doing them naturally as a food source and also it adds that aeration component as well. So I find nice big log trees that are down. I harvest them for the bark as well, like oak trees and hardwood trees. I harvest the bark as the shelters for within our isopod bins. But the inside components, the heart of the tree, to get that nice, loose, crumbly deadfall, it's very spongy and it breaks down. This is invaluable products in the isopod substrate mixes. However, this type of a product is gonna break down far quicker than any of these other products. This would have been harvested probably live and then chipped right up and dried, kiln dried. This product here was harvested as a dead product and it was being broken down by the forest already. The only difference being is I've, I, I've broken it down further by chipping it all up. And the other thing I've done is I've sterilized it in the oven so it breaks it down a little bit quicker and I know that I'm not introducing any other pathogens or potentially other, other isopods into my mix. And the last component is calcium. Calcium or some form thereof is critical for life for isopods, depending on where they come from, as mentioned earlier. If they're a cave species, you're probably going to want to add some pieces of limestone or coralline rock. If you were to go to, say, a pet store that specializes in saltwater or marine animals, they would often have dead corals or coralline rocks, often sold as base rock and things like that. Those are absolutely outstanding products in your mix. The other things that I also use is I use a calcium product called calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is a product that is sold in the reptile industry as used as reptile sands and so forth, but it is actually an edible product. If a reptile is provided with the right elements, the right uh, vitamins from the light, then it can actually absorb this and becomes a dietary supplement as well. The other things that I use and very familiar to people is using things such as cuddle bones. And cuddle bones, are actually the shed bone of the cuttlefish. So it is a natural product as well. And it also performs. With calcium, you can't, it's, it's not a matter of you can't really overdose it. You don't wanna to have too, too much. Obviously you don't wanna, you know, these aren't desert animals, so you don't wanna have a substrate of this, but you wanna make sure that it's prevalent within their mix. And if you don't have any of those products available, the other thing that you can do and we, because we have a farm, is we save eggshells. We're saving eggshells all the time from our farm animals. This is a simple mortar and pedestal. You can grind it down in any way that you choose, any way that you want, and I can mix it down to a fine, fine powder if I want, but honestly, for the most part, I'm probably grinding this up more for show for you guys in the video. Honestly, when we get eggshells, my wife puts them in a little dish beside the sink, and one there's enough there, I take it downstairs, and one on Saturday when I do my maintenance, I just crumble it up by hand into the, into the isopod bins that require it. But you guys wanted to know how we do it right from scratch, so this is all the components for the mix. Now generally, next step is let's look at how I actually go about mixing it. So as mentioned, we want to have our base. Now base is being that sea soil type product, but if sea soil is not available or some of these other, you just want to find a good quality, natural, organic, topsoil type product. You want to add some fir bark or cypress mulch, something like that that's going to air up the mix a little bit. We're going to want to add a fair amount of uh, natural sphagnum moss or natural mosses, but the natural mosses, I will save these little pods and use these as the actual heat, or I'm sorry, uh, humidity sinks in the corners of the units for the animals to retreat to, because remember, isopods are crustaceans. We're gonna wanna throw a bit of charcoal in there. We're gonna wanna throw a lot of that natural wood product. Let's take a peek and see what this looks like mixed up. I believe I'm gonna need a bit more natural earth. We're missing probably the most important component next to that crushed up wood. I wonder what it is. Can you guys think of what it is? Maybe you should pause it right here and put a comment in the comment section. Let me know what you think it is and see if you're right. But let me go get the next component. All right, were you guys able to guess what it was? Well, the most important component that I didn't add or hadn't shown you yet was leaf litter. Leaf litter is such a massive component of the forest floor. Obviously it happens annually, but uh, leaf litter also then can also provide a lot of nutritional source for the animals, as well as it can change the chemistry within the substrate. 
So to me, do I add leaf litter? I add leaf litter in at the end anyways, but we always want to add some leaf litter into the substrate as an integral part of that substrate. As you can see, it's extremely technical in how we go about adding said product. Nothing more so than that. And then we'll just mix it all together. Now, you would probably think that that looks pretty good and it's pretty complete. And in one regard, it is. But the one component we have not added yet was our calcium source. Any good quality calcium, you could literally, if you, if you got money to burn, you could buy calcium tablets at a health store uh, and grind them up. Or you could buy a reptile powder, which is sold as calcium. Just make sure it doesn't need the D3. It doesn't need all the added vitamins. We're just using it as a calcium source. Or very well, eggshells, which is something that we have always available at our place on the farm. And there you go, my friends. That is my isopod substrate. It's loose, it's moisture retentive, it's airy, it's got all the components of what the animals are gonna need. This is the substrate that we're gonna mix. And depending on the animals in question, if I have some, say, more moisture retentive species, like a lot of those Marilunas, they're coming from Vietnam, they're not cave inhabitants, they're forest inhabitants, so they need a little bit more moisture, you might wanna add a bit more of the long fibered sphagnum moss you could even chop it up. You could add some of the different core type products and stuff that retain the moisture a little bit better. Or you can just add any of these more natural wood products. If you have species like a lot of the Spanish species that little like it a little bit drier, you can add more of the different types of products that provide the aeration to the mix as well. But so we have the food components within the sea soil itself. We have the food components for the, the, the plant eaters within the rotting wood, the decaying leaf matter and the mosses and so forth. This is a perfect substrate for all your isopods.